Welcome everyone and thank you for t attending Demo Day. This is my third and it is so thrilling to be here. This evening's Demo Day is a critical to the success of the Start Our program, playing an important role in the development of these teams into companies. The Start Our program is funded 100% through philanthropy and would not be possible without support from mentors, donors, and sponsors, and the community. The generosity of our donors and sponsors helps to develop entrepreneurial leaders and provide resources for innovation and the creation of new startups locally and across the globe. Thank you to all our family of supporters and this year's sponsors. Your contribution is invaluable. I have the pleasure of welcoming the NC MC for tonight, Start Our Accelerator's co-founder, Lara Roscochova and Kim Davis-King. Well, thank you, uh, Dean Ordonez. Again, welcome everybody. My name is Lada, and I am joined today by Kim Davis King, who is um, who is a co-director co of Startup Program. I would especially like to thank our new Startup sponsors, which is Procopio, Garrett Herman, uh, Robert Sullivan, and Julian Sullivan, as well as the uh, Lisa Ordonia. So today is the Start Our Demo Day. Start Our is part of our entrepreneurship center called SEED, which stands for California Institute for Innovation and Development. And in addition to Kim and I, um, I would like to thank for support Professor Vish Krishna, as well as Karen Jensen and Diana Kay, who, who are you know, helping us to organize as well as support all of the different programs. Start R is a ready school startup accelerator. It started in 2012 and it grew from, from the Start R inclusion into many different tracks. Today, we will hear from 11 teams uh, from Start RAD, as well as representative from each different Start R track, inclusion, impact, and veteran ventures. So um, let me let me introduce to you Kim Davis King. So welcome everyone to Start Our Demo Day. Um, to tell you a little bit about what we're going to be doing tonight, we have eleven teams that will make a six-minute pitch followed by a couple of questions. So if you have questions, please put them in chat. We'll have Q&A following each of the presentations. We we'll also wanna give you just a little bit of update on the stats for our Start Our program. Um, so this just tells you you're gonna start our bar the numbers. So we've had over 210s now go through the program. As you can see from the last couple of slides, over 70 mentors. So we really um, rely and like our mentors who help our companies develop their business ideas. Of all of our companies going through the program, we've raised over $134 million worth of funding. We've had four exits. So four companies have been acquired. Three companies have been funded by the Rady Venture Fund, including one of our alumni that you're gonna hear from tonight. And then seven teams are actually on their second startup, so serial entrepreneurs. A few updates from some of the portfolio companies. So Suman, who is a second generation entrepreneur, his first company, Ira, was sold, has started Human AI. He's raised $3.3 million and launched his product. Family Proud and Hydrostatics is currently raising and Sierra Guitars recently did a WeFunder campaign and has raised already almost 600,000. And Nanom has been in the news recently because they have a VR platform and has just closed a round as well. So we're very proud of our alumni companies. We also want to congratulate two of our companies, Brilliant Biom, who is part of Start Our Inclusion and Curies, which is this class of Start Our Inclusion, which you'll hear tonight, were named the 2021 UC Startup Innovation Challenge winners. So congratulations. So our first speaker tonight 
is Mia Ju, who was part of Rady class of 2016. She went through Start Our Inclusion as well as Start Our Rady. And she's here tonight with one of her other colleagues who went through Start Our, John Walensky, who's gonna give us an update on what has she's been up to since graduating from the program and also as the runner up last year of the San Diego Angel Conference. Thank you, Mia. Thanks for the introduction, Kim. Uh, and thanks, uh, Nada and Kim, both of you for, um, for your invitation. Uh, let me see if I can share uh, the screen. Can you see the slides? Let me get started. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here as a starter uh, ready alum. Uh, my name is Mia Du, co-founder and CEO of VisitCell, GBS for Cell Therapy. I am a biomedical engineer by training and I uh, have taken technology from lab to market and have participated in successful exits of two startups. Before I gave an update on where we are today and how far we have come, uh, I would like to give you a little background on our technology. As you have probably seen in the news, immune cell therapy, CAR-T, saves patients like Emily from aggressive cancer and the market is exploding. However, translating the success of these transformative life-saving therapies from liquid tumors to solid tumors have been extremely challenging to say the least. The major problem in the field is we currently do not know whether these cancer-directed killer cells are hitting their marks or not in the patients as intended. There are serious clinical consequences associated with it given that these genetically engineered killer cells need to engage with their tumor target, like lock and key, to assert their therapeutic efficacy. Or if they fail to do so, there may be an unfavorable outcome. With our cell tracking solution to make such a determination for proper tumor target engagement by these cells, the current outcome measures for example, the clinical attributes resulting from the cancer spread or growth in the patients takes three to six months to show. The patients simply don't have that time to wait. It's life or death for the patients. This cell has the solution that locate these cells in real time to monitor their proper tumor target engagement in the body and is simple and easy to use. Mix our patent pending biodegradable nanoparticle with the cells in the laboratory where the cells take up those particles and inject those therapeutic label cells to the patients and observe using standard MRI available in most clinic. The total available market for cell therapy tracking in clinical trials is tremendous at 1.05 billion globally and we plan to capture 44 million by 2024. But we don't stop here. This is our market entry tactics to further reach into the clinical space where there are more than 1.8 million new cancer patients every year in the United States who can benefit from these transformative life-saving immune cell therapy and cell tracking solution like Visit Cell to identify the right product for the right patient. We have significant market traction since start our program and our training at Ready and Race. We made more than half a million in sale last year, and we have shortened and clear FDA path based on our initial discussion with the FDA and regulatory consulting agency. And we have four active academic partnerships, including Stanford University, and two of them have already turned into a paying customer. We hit several major milestones last year amid COVID-19 uh, environment and challenges, of course. 
Uh, to highlight a few, we were a runner up at San Diego Angel Conference and won more than 130,000 in investment. We raised market awareness with QOL at the international conferences and giving platform presentation, although it's virtual, it's the life to these days. And we were recently uh, admitted to the prestigious StartX uh, Stanford Accelerator, where there are more than 12,000 uh, community strongs. And we are very happy about that. And of course, Starter and Ready help us make it possible. We built our great team with more than combined 100 years of experience in this space. And what you see in the green box here is our Ready alum, uh, network and Ready uh, connection that has made a really strong tight team moving the business cell to where we are today. And Dr. John Wieliski is here as Kim uh, highlighted. We built our advisory board uh, last year as well. And our, uh, the serial entrepreneurs and stakeholders in the industry are helping us uh, get to the next level. We raised uh, half a million, more than half a million to date. And we are currently conversing with three funds uh, and we plan to close our round in a couple of weeks. And uh, we are also, of course, a proud Ready Venture Fund portfolio company. And thanks for your support. With that, thank you for your time. And uh, you know, we understand that Ready community is strong and Ready resources are strong. And we are recruiting BD and marketing in terms. So if you are interested, please feel free to reach out. Thank you very much and pleasure to be here. Great. Thank you, Mia. And thank you for giving us such a great update. So I'd like to introduce our first team and they are from Start Art Impact. And Bookcamp is going to tell you a little bit about what they've been up to. So hello, we are Bookcamp. I'm Paloma Santos, a UCSD alumni having majored in cognitive behavioral neuroscience. And this is Austin, a UCSD alumni having majored in cognitive design. And our mission is to help students reach their full potential. Students today are born into a social world, instant connection to anyone they want via social media, Zoom, text, email, the internet, and more. There is connection and social interaction in everything we do, right at our fingertips. One place where this is not true, and sometimes for the worse, is reading. Reading has remained much the same as it has for millennia, which means in many ways it has been left behind. The problem simply put is this. Reading levels in America are lower than they should be and are decreasing. This has only been exacerbated by COVID showing how poorly our education system handles reading in an increasingly digital world. Students not reading at or above third grade reading proficiency are four times more likely to drop out. Reading has remained an important part of learning since its inception, but it's time to optimize reading for the current generation of students so that they could get the most out of their education. We believe that a key way to confronting these issues that will only prove itself more beneficial as time goes on lies in creating a way for students and teachers to better engage with their digital academic material. This fosters an environment of learning where students gain confidence through sharing their experiences, learn better through engaging with their academic material in multiple ways, and allows teachers to better engage and monitor their students because everything is taking place on a single platform. And looking at education through a cognitive science lens, you can see how to better encourage quality reading. Through our platform, we would essentially create small and engaged communities around reading where sharing information is encouraged applying social reinforcement and motivation towards academics and reading only amplifies students' voices. Here is a quick video demonstrating our early book camp mock-up showing the basic tools, functions of the app. Some of these tools include live synchronous reading with peers, multimodal engagement, allows the curriculum to be built into the service, interactive note-taking facilitating thought, dictation tools which help students decode, in-text dictionary, improving vocabulary, and lastly, guided highlighting and note-taking, reinforcing working memory and attention. Reading is a solitary task, and teachers do not have the luxury of reading with each student. In reading alone, students don't have much support and or reassurance in how they're critically reading. By providing a space for students and teachers to better support each other and provide tools to engage with reading as intimately as possible, we will rectify these problems facing our students today. Uh, 
Austin, you're muted. How about now? Okay. Can you hear Perfect. me? Perfect. Okay. Sorry about that, people. So uh, anyway, in regards to our market, our first adopters will be charter and alternative schools in Southern California. These schools are local, uh, allowing for us to build a more intimate connection with them. We're focusing on charter and alternative schools first because they have more freedom generally in determining their curriculum. Uh, from there, we plan to expand to other types of schools and also higher education in California before spreading to other states. Because of the flexibility of our product, we see no reason why it couldn't spread to other regions of the world, giving us a huge opportunity for scaling. So long as you have internet access, we want you to be able to use BookCamp. We're planning on this being a subscription-based model where students will be the direct beneficiaries and have free and open access to the platform. The schools themselves will be the targeted paying customers that allow their teachers access to the platform for classroom use. This will give faculty access to specific features such as class analytics, uh, curriculum structure and moderation tools. We at BookCamp firmly believe that reading only adds to the excitement, curiosity, and wonder of life. Not only do readers enrich their own lives, but the lives of others. This symbiotic relationship creates a more inclusive, interactive, and sound classroom. And when students feel more confident in their reading and comprehension skills, they're more likely to engage in the classroom and improve classroom morale. Furthermore, as students read and reinforce their soft skills like problem solving, motivation, and communication, they can then develop hard skills which lead to more successful futures. This impact will be tracked through surveys from students and teachers, overall grades, and reading comprehension assessments. And in addition to the social impact we hope to make through the use of our platform, we also plan on giving back by helping underprivileged students have better access to reliable internet and education tools. So there are many reading applications and platforms where students and readers can share thoughts on books and read books, but there's no space that combine both of those features seamlessly. Our closest competitor is Google Docs. Although the platform isn't designed to share books, the application can still manage to fulfill the need with tweaking from the user. However, this is inefficient, uh, ineffective, and possibly illegal due to copyright. So BookCamp fills the market because it is made by students for students to help create an enriched space to develop stronger reading skills with their peers. So we've defined our problem and are currently at our prototype milestone. We're designing our early prototype, which will then allow us to test the product with teachers and begin further development of the product. Our ask to you is to help us make contact with school districts, educational advisors, and IT management. Through these con connections, BookCamp would be able to refine our business plan and our product even further. So we'd like to thank the audience for taking the time to come to Demo Day. And we'd also like to thank Kim, Diana, and Lada for helping us tremendously through the whole program. And if you have any questions at all, feel free to drop us an email. And thank you again for attending. So we have one question that came in. Um, so the question was, you saw, we saw a demo um, as part of the pitch. When would you be able to do a beta of the product? When's the timing? Uh, currently, we're working with a mentor, and he's given us a roundabout price, and as well as kind of a time scale. Uh, one of the things we're looking for, in addition to uh, adding other teammates, is someone who's a little more technologically savvy in terms of programming it uh, ourselves in order to save money. So right now, we're looking at maybe six months. Hi, everyone. My name is Sam Pogue, and we are The Choice Point. We are teaching you how to manage your stress by living out your values. Remember how stressful undergrad was? Some of you experienced stress from your desire to get good grades so that you could go off to graduate school and become a great person. Some of us experienced stress because we misprioritize our time or actively chose choose to party instead of study. But we all experienced the challenge of fighting the procrastination bug. I guess not everyone has this problem but they aren't normal. They're probably the same type of people that can eat one chip at a time. But imagine going to school, trying to plan the rest of your life, feeling like every decision will change the fate of your future, only now you're in a global pandemic. Stress is through the roof. In fact, we surveyed 388 UCSD students, and we just wanted to learn how aware of the stresses students were. We were curious about students because research has shown that students who actively participate in acceptance and commitment therapy, which you'll learn about next, can increase their GPA by 0.2 points. 
I wish I would have known that because maybe then I would have had a GPA. Not all of us can be Stanford grads like Carlos, who you'll hear from at the end. But we also chose students because we believe that if we can prove our system can help a college student kick procrastination and sit down and actually study, we think that we can help anyone. Currently, the market is clearly hot on attacking stress. In fact, companies like Headspace, Calm, and Whoop have raised a collective $600 million. However, the APA just did a study and seven out of 10 people just ranked that their stress is up due to COVID. So it's not working. Meditation is not working. Why can't you meditate your stress away? Why don't these mindfulness apps work? Uh, hi, I'm, this is John Baker. Uh, and as our applied science arm of our, uh, of our team, I'm gonna answer that question. Um, mindfulness apps are not enough. Uh, using mindfulness to, wait, to raise one's awareness of a mental health issue without offering a path to a solution is like ending a meeting without actionables. There's no bridge to action. Uh, $600 million of funding is not altering our current course, which is a rising tide of anxiety and depression uh, that's engulfing our world and exacerbated by the pandemic. Uh, acceptance and commitment therapy, ACT for short, is an empirically supported therapeutic solution that has been successfully delivered remotely. Although ACT includes a mindfulness pillar, similar to the apps we saw earlier, it goes further than mindfulness apps using values engagement as a bridge to action and behavioral change. The problem that we face is that engaging with and living by one's values is challenging. Uh, it's difficult to do, which is why we are offering a familiar feeling digital solution. Thanks, John. So I'm Seth Gibson. I'm the development lead for the Choice Point. And as John said, our goal here is to take the hallmarks of a typical acceptance commitment therapy session and present it as a simple to use digital experience by taking advantage of some of the more common interaction paradigms found in popular social media and online experiences. So in this first wireframe, we see what we call the values survey exercise, wherein we help a user drill down from a, a large list of of values come from that are derived from research to a smaller list that they feel best represents themselves. And jokingly, we call this values Tinder, because as you, if you look at the first wireframe, you're presented with a statement of values. And if the value resonates with you, you swipe right. If it doesn't, you swipe left. And as you go through the exercise, eventually you arrive at that, that sub list, we call that. That's those, uh, those, those six hallmark values that you think really resonate with you. And that's and the, the goal of, the, uh, of this is to present you with notifications every so often to remind you to, to, to stop and think about, are you living in a way that is aligned with your values? Now that's all well and good, but what is the action part of this that John spoke of? Well, in the next wireframe, this we call uh, jokingly uh, values Instagram or action gram, we take advantage of an activity that most users are probably already doing, that is capturing and tagging images. So the user is prompted to capture an image of something they're probably doing, and then they're presented again with that list of values wherein they can tag the image with one of those values and over time build up a feed or a collection of values tagged images. And so in this way, we hope to move our users from just thinking about what they're doing to actively and mindfully being in the moment and realizing how they're aligning with their values, moving from the, common, the commonly seen paradigm nowadays in social media of virtue signaling, whereas where, wherein you are expressing to the world how you align with external values and ideas to what we call value signaling, where you are expressing to the world and more importantly yourself, how you align with your own internal values. So cool, so we have some theory, we have an application. How are we gonna make money off of this? So th thanks, thanks Seth. Before I dive into some of the business side, I wanna talk about our founding team. It's one of our strengths. My name is Carlos Quinton. I'm an MBA at Rady. I'm Flex Evening 21, I'll be handling business development and strategy. I have an extensive background in professional baseball, Seth, who just walked you through those elaborate wireframes of VR. Head developer, CTO, has an extensive background in software development. Sam, we started us off, is expertise in digital marketing. He has worked for several companies in that space. Is our, he'll be our chief marketing officer. And then John will be handling the translation of acceptance commitment therapy to Seth, who digitize. And he has an extensive background in um, professional baseball and is the head of all minor league development for the Pittsburgh Pirates and has just uh, just completed his master's of performance psychology. Now, we need to prove our system and that, to do that, we need a validation market. And what we're looking at for our market is the little over 4,000 US colleges and universities. And we're gonna focus on the four year college and universities here, that's 2,700. Now, an interesting fact is of those four year institutions, 
approximately 70% do not, I repeat, do not have full-time psychiatric help for their students. We feel like this is a segment that's underserved. We feel like we can improve our system and we feel like we can make a huge impact in care. Now, as for our business model, we're looking to validate our system with a freemium model. Now I stress free because we want to acquire users and that's where these undergrads come into play. And then we want to transition into serving universities that have wellness centers that are looking to support their student bodies, especially during this time. And then because acceptance commitment therapy is so applicable and increases retention and compliance in so many different fields and has empirical data to prove that, we feel like we have, can, can transition and expand even bigger into enterprises and, and uh, serve industries or companies and companies in different industries that are looking to improve in those areas by building customized systems to their needs. Now, again, looking at our timeline and go-to-market strategy, it's going to be fairly straightforward. And as I was mentioning, it's going to develop. We're going to go to develop, validate, B2C, B2B. And that's taking acceptance commitment therapy from analog to digital, looking to prove it with undergrads, to present it in, to universities and colleges, and eventually expand into enterprises as we look to get bigger. Our ask today is for mentorship and advisors, introductions to investors, primarily uh, angels, and then eventually seed capital. Um, we thank you for your time and we'll be open for questions. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, if anybody from the audience has a question, please type it in, into the chat. We have one question already, and that is, could you tell us where you are in the development and what's the timeline for launch? Yeah, I can take that. So, uh, so we actually do have some prototypes stood up on device. Uh, our, I think the big gap we're missing right now is is uh, integrating our backend, and we would like to do a pass with a with a user experience designer who we whom we've engaged, but we just haven't brought on board yet. So, but we do have working prototypes that, like I said, are just missing what you know that that kind of user interaction polish. But we feel like we could probably go to close technical alpha and then beta probably within one to three months. One month meaning I don't sleep for the next couple of weeks, three months probably being more realistic. Thank you. And second question is around your privacy policy. How do you assure privacy of your users? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so yeah, uh, I, part of my background, as you saw, you know, I've worked for companies like Facebook, Intel, uh, HTC, who actually had a, a bit of a run in uh, over PII. So we're, we're very well versed in, um, you know, what, what you are and aren't supposed to do as far as personal information. And so that means respecting things like GDPR in markets where, where that's required. And of course, uh, being compliant with everything that's, um, you know, that's required of the US market. So that's everything, you know, simple things like, you know, encrypted databases all the way up to, you know, the obvious thing of not capturing more information than we need. And again, that's all kind of still still up in the up in the air as far as what that actually means. But yeah, our goal is not to, you know, is not to just scrape, you know, mass amounts of information just to have, you know, we only want to, again, like I said, we only want what we need to get the job done. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Kiri's. Um, here, first, I wanted to thank Mia from Business Cell for talking about cell therapy, because right now we're really at a transformational phase where diseases which have previously not had cures, maybe they were death sentences in some cases, they have miraculous therapies coming out onto the market, such as, you know, the COVID vaccines that are coming out. The issue is, is that oftentimes these new treatments require lengthy clinical trials from five to 10 years. That's why Curies wants to connect the right patients to the right clinical trials to make finding a clinical trial as easy as finding a new movie to watch on Netflix. So just a quick introduction to our team. Karen and I have been working with some of the top pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies focusing on the innovative treatments for the future. And the problem that we're really seeing now is enrollment issues. So enrollment issues are the reason why so many wonderful new drugs, ultimately they're not going to touch a single patient's life. And so when we're looking at, you know, the worst funnel in the world on the right side, 50% um, of patients are curious about entering clinical trials. They would want to participate if it's offered. However, only 0.2% of physicians actually refer patients to clinical trials, leading to only 5% of eligible patients enrolling. And 25% of trials fail before they even begin. That's one in four drugs that could potentially be life-saving, never really seeing anyone. The issue here is that 
tremendous in information inefficiency. So even though only 0.2% of physicians refer patients to clinical trials, 90% say that they want to discuss those options with patients. So what's the holdup here? Why is that such a huge gap? Um, the, in, the issues are threefold. The first one is that 54% lack access to clinical trial information. 48% don't know where to refer patients. They don't know who to talk to. And 33% simply don't have time to stay on top of research and understand all these new trials. The issue is essentially this. So if a doctor wanted to match a patient to a clinical trial, they have to read this novel here, which is the clinical trial eligibility criteria. Doctors who have multiple patients who need to match them into multiple trials simply don't have the time to understand all the technical details and keep track of that all inside their minds. That's why the clinical trial recruitment market is really booming with 5.3 billion expected by 2030. The bulk of this is going to be in some of the most important diseases to fight, such as cancer, which is where we're going to start. The issue with this market is that there's so many gaps. Right now, the three main ways have tremendous inefficiencies. So we talked about the first one, which is physician referrals. For physicians, um, it's time intensive and tedious. They don't have the time to go through all of that. The second aspect, which is direct to patient marketing, is very expensive. Patients simply distrust direct ads to them if it's not coming from a physician. So you see extremely low ad response rates. And this is very, very costly. And lastly, clinical trial online finders, they're great, but they can't find specific trials targeted to the patient. And that's where we come in. Thank you, Kevin. To summarize, Curious will give providers all of the possible trial options for each of their individual patients. We will set up an integration or a data flow between the provider's EHR, electronic health record system, and Curious. Then Curious can automatically extract that patient information and match that into our real-time clinical trial database. This will be using natural language processing, NLP, and artificial intelligence, AI. Additionally, we'll also be able to provide a simple breakdown of the benefits and um, risks for the trials for those individual patients. So why now? With the following listed trends, now is really the optimal time for Curies. More and more hospitals are using EHRs, such as Epic, and there is increasing availability to use EHR data, such as with the launch of the Epic App Orchard in 2017. NLP has also been making huge leaps, even within the past few months, and legislative pressures such as the High Tech Act are really encouraging that use of EHR data. So our business model really wants to keep the barrier low for patients and providers. Rather than charging providers or patients, we'll be charging directly to clinical trial administrators. And this is because they have that set budget for recruitment procedures, which would include Curies. Our goal is to provide patients the option to access these potentially life-saving therapies through their providers. Clinical trial administrators would be getting not only the patients who are interested, but those who have already been screened through the trial's eligibility criteria. So starting with our pancreatic cancer MDP, we'll wanna use this to beta test and iterate our product. Next, we'll want to expand disease indications to those with significant unmet need. And lastly, we'll want to retain the partners who help us beta test and also expand our partnerships to more hospitals and independent practices. We've made huge strides in the past few months. Most notably, we've joined Start Our Inclusion and we won the 2021 UC Innovation Social Impact Award. We also recently launched our website, CuriesHealth.com. This year, our next steps are to number one, recruit that technical talent and build our MVP. We also want to develop relationships with physicians who would be those early adopters and help test Curies and also find mentors in the tech and biotechnology space. Thank you all so much for listening and please visit us at curieshealth.com. So we have one question that came in. As a user, can I make sure I'm not placed in a placebo group in a trial. So that's something that's outside of our control. We could only recommend you to a clinical trial. All of that's determined by the clinical trial coordinators at that uh, facility. Great. And then the next question, what milestones do you have to meet to be financially successful? So 
So currently we're bootstrapping, so our costs are extremely low. And of course, as a software company, we don't have any fixed costs uh, to go with. So um, in order to meet our milestones, essentially what we're trying to do is we have roughly $200 um, per patient referral. Uh, we're trying to start with pancreatic cancer as our first MVP and trying to ramp up uh, drastically in sales and referrals, um, hitting a few hundred thousand by the end of this year. And the last question was, how do you access the EHR data? Yeah, so uh, essentially different EHRs have different integrations. So for the one that we're targeting first, which is Epic, is used in roughly 60 to 70% of American hospitals. And they have their own sort of integrations that you use, kind of like the Apple App Store. Um, and you just plug in play, essentially. Hello, everyone. My name is Daniela, and I'm here today with my co-founder, Avi. And today we're going to talk about Jeweled, the dating app, transitioning into a more meaningful relationship. So Avi and I are part of UCSD, I'm part of UCSD School of Medicine, and Avi is a part of UCSD Health. And we have Ren who does graphic design and software engineering. We have Leland who does marketing and advertising, and we have Alex who does web design and software engineering. So today I wanna to talk about a problem. So I'm a transgender woman, which means I don't exclusively identify with my sex assigned at birth. And so dating has always been extremely difficult for me. And for the longest time, I assumed if I transitioned that love was something that just wasn't meant for me. I used to use really sketchy websites to meet men such as Craigslist. And a lot of these people would not want to meet with me in public. I remember one date I went on with this guy and we went to the movie theater and he bought my tickets and then we sat down in the theater. He then got so uncomfortable and ashamed with being with me in public because I was transgender, he went back to the front desk, returned the tickets and left me there stranded. This was how dating was for me. And any dating app I used, I constantly was being banned from the dating apps for being transgender and apps that were dedicated to trans people would just sexualize and fetishize me. I used to receive paragraph long death threats from men of how they would murder and kill me. I didn't know what to do. And for the longest time, I, I didn't want to be transgender anymore. I do believe though that in the past decade, there's been a shift in gender culture, which has opened a new market space that hasn't been tapped into yet. And so I ask all of you, how do we transition to a more empowered community of belonging and safety in the transgender online dating world? I present to you Jewel, the dating app, transitioning into a more meaningful relationship. Jewel is unique from other dating apps because we incorporate a personality questionnaire so users can answer questions about themselves in order to determine their personality type. This personality type will then be linked with a gemstone and then they can swipe through users based on compatibility of their gemstone and the other user's gemstones. We'll also allow users to identify as their unique gender identity and search gender identities that they're wishing to date. We'll also have a trans education verification process and community building chat rooms. We will also incorporate psychosocial therapeutic features and have push notifications with unique trans history and trans statistics. And in our app, only trans people will be allowed to message first and will have a strong sense of security and surveillance. In terms of our market size and trends, there was a study done at the Williams Institute in 2016 that showed 0.6% of US Americans identify as transgender. That's 2 million Americans, which is twice what it was a decade ago. So the market is on the incline. And if you look at the Gen Z population, it's at 0.7%, which is even higher. Match did a study back in 2018 that showed 56% of LGBT singles have dated someone online with trans people dating the most online. And a study was done in 2019 that showed that one in eight people across the US and Canada are open to dating a trans person. And due to the pandemic, Apptopia has shown that there's been an increase in 1.5 million daily active users in dating apps. And our projected market size is about 43 million. Thank you, Daniela. Hi, everyone. My name is Ami. I'm the co-founder of Jeweled App. We did a survey in the beginning of our development and 246 people had responded to the survey. About 88 of 246 had responded that they identify as cisgender male. Cisgender meaning identifying as your sex assigned at birth. And in regards to their sexual orientation, about 28.5%, more than a quarter of our surveyors identify as straight or heterosexual. So our trans app is geared for the trans person, but it was surprising to see that other customer is actually the cisgender heterosexual man. 
Jeweled app is based on a premium business model with Jeweled Unlock for features like unlimited matching capabilities, unlimited radius um, search opportunities, and seeing who matches with you. According to Tinder's 2019 data, about 8% of its users are paid subscribers. Our Jeweled Unlock is going to be a fraction of $10 a month, and our hope to um, gain revenue of subscription of $34.4 million a month. According to our survey, the top three um, dating app competitors are Tinder, OkCupid, and Grindr. Jules app provides a psychosocial feature that will compete with the other dating apps that, um, that are on our landscape. Our go-to market strategy as of this moment includes social media, landing page, and guest appearances. In our novice development stage, we're gonna use Instagram and Facebook and YouTube to narrate the two co-founder story, me and Daniela, and building a business. Our landing page would be creating a blog presence and informing our customers about our app developments. Our upcoming appearances include Men Like Us podcast and Lex Newman Live. We have three main phases of our app development. The first phase of our development is to mainstream our user interface by using artificial intelligence in our mess messaging and matching algorithm. In our second phase of development, we will create a more robust psychosocial feature by partnering with the psychotherapeutic app and that with the tap of a finger, you can consult with a therapist at any stage of your dating journey. In our third phase of development, we will expand our demographic into all gender identities, not only the trans and trans attracted. In each prototype, we will do A-B testing before we go to market, and each phase is about one to two year duration. Our goal for our first phase of development is 150K to investigate and research and hire an app developer and also coordinated marketing and advertising in accordance to our go live. And of course, networking opportunity. I would like to end this presentation with a quote by Dipanjan Chatterjee. This is the new normal. This is not the topic that people discuss and debate. This is life. Thank you so much for your time. And this is our email and our Instagram jeweled app. Thank you very much. We have a few questions. One of them is, how do you ensure that uh, the users of your app uh, remain safe? Um, well, we're going to have a very strong security and surveillance that's watching messages and how people are messaging users. And we also can incorporate tracking features just to ensure that we know where these users are meeting in case something does happen um, that is unusual. In terms of trying to eliminate individuals that are like, you know, just looking for a fetishized hookup and things like that. We have a lot of features in the app to try to limit that interaction, not that it's not completely impossible, but with the trans education verification process, we'll be educating all users of the app of trans individuals and their experiences. I think to add, it's also important to have those safeguards right in the beginning of um, signing up for an application like this. So having a sign up feature where they would, uh, where we would um, see if, uh, if you're looking for a relationship that is transitioning into something meaningful, that would hopefully create the first safeguard of um, um, people um, using this app as predators. Okay, next question is, what's the, what the legal, uh, legal regulations around limiting uh, the dating apps to certain genders? Um, well, a lot of dating apps already sort of incorporate gender identities. Um, obviously, if you are a individual who's a cis man who wants to find a cis woman and you're not looking for trans people, it is possible with our searching features. We just don't think it'll be likely based on our marketing and how we're advertising the app initially in our phase one of development. But apps currently, such as OkCupid, you can identify as a trans woman already. Thank you. There are lots of questions and I would suggest that, uh, that the people with all of the different questions contact you after that demo day. It was a great presentation, such an important topic. Thank you so much. 
Good evening, everybody. Thanks for being here. My name is uh, Jason Fetish, and along with me tonight is Ted Pease. We are both part of the Flex Evening 2021 cohort, and we are lifeguard, providing peace of mind for the pool. We're going to start out with a short video that encapsulates the problem we want to solve. But before we do, I want to I want you to keep in mind a couple of statistics. Every day in the United States alone, nearly 10 people fall fatal victim to a drowning. An additional 50 people, again, every single day, seek out emergency medical care, but will ultimately survive a drowning-related incident. Many of those survivors will suffer medical shortcomings that will last a lifetime. The water sitting on the steps. Swimming instructor Jessica Kretz is in the middle of the pool, along with three other teachers working with children. Less than a minute later, the boy gets on the floating device and it slips out from underneath him. The boy going underwater and he's seen struggling, drowning for two minutes. On multiple occasions, Kretz and other teachers are seen within feet of the boy and they don't see what's happening. Kretz then notices the boy is drowning and pulls him out of the water, calling for another teacher to perform CPR. Investigators say he was unconscious and blew in. Even in this distracted world, lifeguard believes drownings are entirely preventable. And we aim to be the catalyst that makes this picture the norm in this distracted world that we find ourselves in. So what is lifeguard? Lifeguard is simply an AI powered underwater camera system that monitors your pool and detects drowning in real time. Lifeguard can discriminate between other objects and humans, and most importantly, it can help alert users when people are in the pool and supposed to be in the pool. It's not simply a pool uh, system that prevents people from entering the pool. So the system comes with, uh, will sell for $500 and is effective right out of the box. It comes with two cameras and a back end uh, unit that does all the processing and will alarm should it detect drowning. It's easy to install and comes at a fixed cost. Additionally, you can add on a video surveillance as a service monitoring program for $10 per month. This video surveillance will allow a user to monitor their pool remotely. It'll store videos in the cloud and can even contact the authorities in the event it detects drowning. So our competition mainly focuses around fences, pool covers, and door alarms. Most people have to abide by these building codes in order to get the system set up and get their pools registered with the, with the building codes. Door alarms are frequently taken off. Wearable detection devices only work when you are wearing them. Fences and covers simply work to keep people out of the pool. Pool entry detection systems that are currently on the market frequently alarm at different objects such as branches or pets or a cat or whatever falling in the pool. Other AI systems that are on the market right now are not very well known and they also will only detect drowning after the event has already occurred. Lifeguard is the only system that really detects drowning in real time and alerts the users when it's happening. The market is fast approaching 11 million pools in the United States alone. The picture in the top right depicts the residential market, which is your homeowners. This is our initial go-to-market strategy and will initially be a business to consumer strategy. Uh, and this makes sense because one, it is the larger segment of the market. And it's also where about 80% of the drownings actually occur. This will also allow us to build a foundation of data and prove product efficacy before we attack the commercial market, which is depicted by picture number two. This market consists of city, state, and county pools, as well as gyms and hotels. We think this is a critical market for us because it'll be a great launching point into the international arena. And our long distance goal with Lifeguard is a potential military application. And this, think naval ships as they deploy and port in abroad, uh, they can deploy the Lifeguard system and fend off any nefarious activities. So the team consists of uh, Ted, who just spoke, uh, he'll head up operations and the relationships. Uh, he'll graduate later this year and is a current active duty, active duty Navy officer. Uh, myself, I'll head up sales and marketing. I will also graduate ready this year and have been doing medical device sales for GE Healthcare for the last 10 years in a, and am a 12 year Army officer veteran as, self, uh, as well. Uh, Ted's older brother, Greg, is an additional co-founder and will head up technology and development. Uh, Greg has a master's in control systems uh, and 
has 25 years of engineering systems and consumer design experience. So this year we did our ideation phase during our lab to market project for Rady. Throughout the rest of the year, we hope to conduct our initial prototype building on top of what we did with UCSD's Jacobs engineering capstone product or project. We were able to get an initial test with one user in the water and detect drowning events with a 98% accuracy rate with a basic AI system and a commercial off the shelf camera that we built. In the next year, we hope to file our provisional patents, advance our prototype development, get beta testing data, form our corporation, and begin to start getting pre-sales. In 2022, we hope to execute our go-to-market strategy that Jason discussed, and in 2023, we'll continue to iterate and grow our product offerings. A big advance that we got recently was that the American Society for Testing and Materials just added active pool monitoring systems, such as LifeGuard, to an acceptable standard for safety devices for pools. And California this year also adopted that as a standard. So with current market trends heading towards our direction, we are one of the first people to start working on and developing a product that will detect drowning in real time. What we're asking for are contacts and connections specializing in AI and any partners in distribution and development that you think would be helpful for us. We are Lifeguard, we appreciate your time and thank you. Thanks team. We have two questions that came in. The first one is, could this solution be used for the beach? versus just pool safety? Uh, no, this is not a, right now, this is not a good uh, pool or a beach based off of clarity of water. So one of the big issues with using the camera system is that we need to be able to see a further distance and pools offer that type of clarity of water. Okay. And then the second question, has the system been tested already? Any shortcomings could end up with fatal results and possible legal actions. How are you prepared for that risk? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, this is part of our prototyping piece. Uh, we were this year able to develop an initial AI uh, system that detected drowning based off of a, a minimal uh, one type of drowning. So kind of a ladder step drowning, but it did discriminate between drowning events and active swimming. Uh, but that was with one person in the water. So our goal is to make sure we're at that 99.9% .9 efficacy rate. Also, uh, we are not going to market as we prevent drowning, right? We, we're going to market as this is a, an additional system to help you monitor your pool and to help keep your pool safe. So that part of the, that legal uh, ease in terms of our marketing and what we say about our product is gonna help with some of those legal ramifications that we're, we're working for. Hi, my name is Takabe Fujimoto. Patrick and I are full-time MBA students who started 2022 at the Ready School of Management. I was inspired to start Neurovision because of the experience I had with my father. This photo was taken in 2016 at the nursery home on Christmas. Two years ago from this time, my father, who is the center of the photo, had a severe stroke. Since then, he has not been able to walk on his own. My father was only 60 years old. He could have spent the rest of his life in the hospital but he overcame the toughest rehabilitation in the world. Luckily, he was able to go home, but he gave up the most of the hobbies and still there is a lot of anxiety. Many older people live with anxiety. There are fear of cognitive decline and loss of social ties. On the other hand, younger generation wants to share more time with their distant family members. During COVID-19, many misfortunes make them realize the importance of family. Through the interviews, we found out that old people want to learn more about new technologies from younger generation. At the same time, the younger generation has expressed interest in a service that connect them with their grandparents. To tackle this problem, we are developing Neurovision, a service that provides a platform where families can share vivid experiences remotely through digital devices. We've interviewed elderly suffering from a range of physical and cognitive impairments and concluded that the one thing that they miss most in their lives is sharing experiences with the ones that they love. These moments of communication, sharing new experiences together, promote relaxation, connection, and a sense of well being. Underlying these emotional benefits is neurocognitive stimulation that has been shown to be effective at slowing cognitive decline and improving quality of life. Neurovision is VR on a mission. 
Neurovision's goal is to stimulate higher brain function in those with declining cognitive abilities while providing a bridge for elderly to connect with the younger generation. I'd like to provide a use case. Mike is a teenager living in San Diego. His grandfather lives in a nursing home and suffers from dementia. The two used to go fishing together often, but David is no longer mobile. Fortunately, Mike discovered Neurovision, a VR application that promises to help him connect with his grandfather again, doing what they love together, fishing. Mike signed up for the service, chose his location, and visited his grandfather to help him use the app. The interface is simple and using Neurovision is easy with the help of a loved one. Mike and his grandfather, David, can now experience an interactive, lively, visual, visual and visceral experience of fishing next to each other in virtual reality. Most importantly, Neurovision allows communication and connection with a loved one for a shared experience that was once lost. The experience can be shared between loved ones in the same room or across the globe. An essential feature that adds to the immersiveness of Neurovision is vision analysis, which uses AI algorithms to interpret an object's movement and translates those movements into vibrational feedback, similar to touch sensations you get from a real experience. There's also chat functions and the ability to switch between views. Our beta experience is a fishing experience. However, in the future, we plan to add other types of experiences, such as hiking and traveling. So we're currently testing a subscription service business model in which users can have full access to the library of experiences for a monthly fee. We're also testing and building a dedicated network of content providers who continuously create new experiences and upload them to the library. Currently, we have partnership agreements with content providers, including YouTube and Twitter influencers. We have a number of indirect competitors in the VR space. Our differentiator is our focus on shareability, interaction, and its health benefit implications. YouTube VR, for example, is not shareable between family members. There is no interaction, no communication with others in real time, and no integrated vibration feedback. Neurovision combines these features to compound the positive effect of VR on those with neurocognitive disorders like Alzheimer's and dementia. Some relevant research to inform our trials include meta-analyses, which suggest that using VR intervention in elderly with cognitive impairment results in improved memory, tasking, and attention, as well as psychological improvements showing an increase in levels of well being and a decrease in anxiety. We're currently testing on elderly with neurocognitive disorders to evaluate what significant effects Neurovision's virtual experiences and interactions can have on brain stimulation. We're able to record and analyze brain waves using modern EEG technology. We're currently working on our proof of concept, and our first beta will be the fishing experience. This is our team, Takumi and myself along with some of the organizations we've been a part of. Now, what do we need? We need to conduct research. We need beta customers, product managers, marketers, software engineers, and investors. We hope you take away the message that Neurovision was conceived and developed with the goal of bringing families together and easing the psychological and emotional symptoms associated with neurocognitive disorders in the elderly. We hope to bring comfort and connection to loved ones, to fight off loneliness, anxiety, and isolation, which in the era of COVID-19 has never been a greater threat. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. We have a few questions. The first one is, have you tested your system live with seniors? They see, uh, unlike young folks, seniors seem to have challenges navigating VR scapes. Could you comment on that? Sure, so we are currently testing um, beta and, and we are on the hardware development software stage, but we are aware of the obvious hurdle, which is helping seniors adopt technology. Seniors and technology don't necessarily go hand in hand, but we are developing a process for those loved ones to help them overcome that first hurdle. And VR has been gaining traction in its user interface and simplicity uh, for years, and it's actually much easier to use this technology than previously. My name is Nada. I'm a Ready Full Time 2016 student, and our company name is Paisa, and we are from Stata Ready Group. Paisa is an online lending platform with a hybrid business model, and we are trying to solve two big challenges in the industry, which is liquidity and efficiency. The online lending is growing significantly in the last five years at a rate of 41% year over year, and in a recent survey, 
50% of the borrowers are preferring fintech lending compared to other small traditional banks. This is how it works. The lenders and the borrowers will connect to the platform. The lenders initiate the loans through the platform and the borrowers make the payments through the platform. And the platforms take commission out of those payments. Now, most of the current lending platforms are struggling with this business model because they have negative earnings and their funding potential is very limited because they, are, they have very few lenders. And at the same time, there is no secondary market, meaning the lenders can't buy them. The lenders are kind of stuck with the borrowers for the entire loan period. And for, even for lenders, it's the same. The, the problem is same, which is zero liquidity. And these are considered as high risk loans because these are unsecured personal loans. So risk averse customers like small banks or retail investors, credit unions, they kind of avoid these market loans. Borrowers, 90% of their loan applications get rejected because the platforms have limited funds. Now, before addressing this problem, let's just look at the characteristics of these amortized loans. If you break those loans in two halves, in the first half, these loans usually generate majority of the returns and also carry majority of the risk. Even for platforms, they generate 90% of the revenue in the first half itself. In the second half, the story is completely different. It's the opposite. Very, risk, very low risk and very low return. And even for platforms, it's just 10% of the commission they get from the second half. But when you look at the principles, most of the principle is paid in the second half. It's more like first half, high risk, high return period, and the second half is low risk, low return period. And we think that there are two different characteristics of the same amortized loans, and we want to tailor this according to the risk appetite of the lenders. What we are doing is taking a 36-month 36 month loan, let's say, and we're breaking it into two halves. In the first half, we are making the initial investors to raise the loans and then hold the loans in the first half. And after the first half, we will buy back the loans and sell it to our partners who are small banks and trade unions in the second half. This way, the initial lenders who are big investors, they can keep the returns in high because they can just stay in the first half loans and gain more returns. And in the second half, these uh, small banks and trade unions, they got a new market opportunity to invest. And that's low, uh, risk is low and they still can maintain decent returns. Now on the surface, it may look very simple and easy to maintain, but it has significant logistical challenges to meet, which is, which is what we're trying to do. We're trying to build a supply chain of the lender. So it's not easy to transfer loans from one lender to other lender. So that's a logistical challenge. And we also have some technical challenges, which is we have to identify the right loan breakpoint and also properly manage the inventory. And by inventory, we mean the principal we have to pay at the end of second first half to the primary lenders. And we are using obviously the optimization modeling and advanced machine algorithms to help us in solving these issues. Now, we are left with one question. Is this really good enough? What benefit can the platform and the lender get by making this small change? Well, we want to test our model, compare it with the current lending platforms and how does our model perform if it is really in the market. So we use the simulation modeling technique to compare the performance of our model with the current platforms across different kinds of loans that are available in the market. And in every single loan, our platform is performing significantly higher than the current platforms. The returns for the primary lenders are much higher. And even for the platforms itself, the outperform my PISA is outperforming the current platforms. And the reason is very simple and it is compounding interest. The interest just keeps compounding irrespective of the risk that uh, lenders are taking in the first half or second half. And that's what triggering these significant benefits from PISA. Now, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves and call it a most powerful model in the, in the history of humankind. We just want to test more realistic scenarios on our model and see what are the limitations for our model and what can we do about them. So right now, we are in that phase. And with PISA, with this hybrid business model, we're not just only solving the problems of the primary lenders, which is liquidity and higher returns. We're also solving the problem of the risk averse lenders by creating them a new asset class. At the same time, we are generating more loans to address the problem of borrowers and also the platform revenue itself. We, I don't want to spend much time on this because we all know the potential of unsecured personal loans in the US. Especially for fintech platforms, it's really high and it's just getting better and better every year, especially after COVID, it's expected to grow even higher. So we don't, again, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves and say that we're going to capture one or two percent of this $55 billion market, but we can clearly understand that there is a huge potential for fintech lending platforms 
and if we can use the lender's money optimally and efficiently, we can get the most out of it. Coming to the competition from investors' perspective, traditional banks don't usually give them an option to invest in unsecured loans. But then that's why we got a lot of on digital lending platforms. Most of it, most of those platforms in terms of liquidity perform poor, except just one startup which recently went IPO, that is Upstart. But their business model is similar to ours, except that they have an approach that's exactly opposite to ours. Meaning we take initial lend money from initial lenders and then we raise the loans and then later buy sell it to our small banks. And Upstart does the opposite. They make the small banks make the loans, initiate the loans, and then later sell it to the big banks. Into the progress, we uh, finished the initial research and development and uh, MVP stage. And right now, we are building the simulation model to test the limitations of our model. And the plots you saw there are what came out of this model. And we're still building on, the, on those models. And in terms of needs, as of now, we're not looking for any investments, but we just need ad advisor guidance in terms of fintech regulations and the partnership with small banks and introduction to investors. This is our team. I'm Naga. I'm the CEO, and I have eight years of experience. And I come from an engineering and analytics background. And my, my other partner is Sandeep Gutta, who has a PhD and he has experience working on machine learning models since eight years. And my, our other uh, partner is uh, Prakash Koneru, who works, who worked in startups in the past, and also uh, helping us with building our uh, platform from end to end. And that's all we have for today. If you have any questions, feel free to do that now. Thank you for your presentation. Um, our first question is, are you partnering with customer facing businesses looking to set up their own financing or credit programs for consumers? As of now, that's not our target. We don't, we, we don't want to provide a platform for small businesses uh, as a lending platform because we ourselves want to build a lending platform. So we are focusing towards that, but eventually our platform can be used by small banks to set up their own lending platforms. Hope this answers your question. And do you handle repayments, account servicing, or collections? Uh, there are uh, third-party vendors who work on these collections. So we just uh, sell these loans in terms of deep in uh, in the term, in times of default. We sell those loans to those third parties, and they get they give us ten or twenty percent of the principal back, and we just give it back to the lenders. And that's how even the current platforms are working. We won't be any different from that. And then the last question we can take is, what if the borrower can't return the money? Will you be handled to be specialized debt collectors? What if the borrower is unable to repay it back? Uh, just like current platforms, when the borrower doesn't pay the back, it's the investor's loss and uh, lender's loss. And that's the risk they know when they are coming into the platform. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Ron Baldwin, and I am the CEO of Relay Play, where every week our local experts create and personalize a weekend guide of experiences for each of our members. How many people get to the weekends and have no idea what they're going to do? This was me working a very busy job, takes up most of my time during the week. And when I finally make it to the weekend, I have no idea what to do. And because of this, I wind up missing out on different events that I, I really didn't know that were happening. Or I spend my free time sitting around doing nothing. Or even worse, in my opinion, wasting a lot of time scrolling through some of these event aggregator sites to try and find something to do. And it seemed like it was impossible to find something that was good in those laundry lists of events and activities. So I knew that there had to be a better way. And it got me thinking, why not create something that was much more personalized and incorporated the value that local experts within a community could actually offer. So I started creating Relay Play, and I'll share a short 30 second video here so you can see what I've been building. At Relay Play, we pair you with local experts who create personalized experiences just for you. Every week, they can surprise you with new experiences, or you can make special requests. They will then find your top five experiences and personalize them just for you before sending them over every Wednesday. So you can get excited for your weekend without spending hours trying to find fun things to do. Relay Play. Experiences personalized. So as you saw here, we pair our members with local experts to create a much more personalized weekend guide. And it doesn't require all the research and planning that sometimes goes along with it. And our business model for this is to build revenue in three different ways. 
First, we plan to start by offering this as a subscription service where our users would pay to get their, of course, their top five experiences, as well as gain access to bonus features and special perks and discounts that we have with our partners, as well as interaction with their local expert. As we grow, we then plan to include advertisements as well as ticketed events and activities that we would be able to create specifically for our members as we get to know them. And we see a lot of opportunity for growth in this space. One trillion dollars was what was spent worldwide in 2019 on the experience economy. And if you look at the millennial population alone, who we know greatly values experiences, spent $240 billion of that. And we're currently just looking at 30 million millennials that live in those top 100 cities in the US. And we believe that we can attract 2 million of those to generate over a billion dollars from subscriptions, advertisements, and ticketed events. So how are we different? First and foremost, we use real experts to curate and personalize our weekly recommendations. We are not a generic list of experiences. And we create ways for our members and our experts to actually interact with each other. We also offer those exclusive perks that I member, mentioned to our members that they couldn't get anywhere else. And lastly, we also have plans to pair our members with experts in other cities where we're operational to be able to provide those personalized recommendations when traveling. So if I wanna to go to Denver, I'll be paired up with a local expert that's in Denver who can create those experiences for me when I travel to that city. We took Relay Play to market just this past November. And since then, we've been generating some very nice growth from word of mouth and direct traffic. We also are providing a month of our service for free while we pilot and learn from our customers. And we're looking to use that as a way to continue to generate word of mouth referrals. We are also generating traffic from Facebook and Instagram, a presence that we have there, as well as through organic search traffic, as you can see on this Google Analytics dashboard. So we are fully operational in San Diego. It's where we first developed our web platform and a lot of the data science components that are incorporated here. We've beta tested Relay Play with a large number of users over the last year to continue to test our hypotheses as well as try out new features as we move forward. And we have plans to launch into new cities as well so we can really start generating these experiences for our members as, as they travel to some of these new cities. And of course, as travel opens up again. We're currently adding around five subscribers a week, spending a little less than $35 on awareness. And we're excited to <laughs> tell you a little bit about ourselves. So a little bit about me and Edward. I'm a Naval veteran and a product innovator. I've been building and launching products at HP for the last several years. Edward, of course, he balances me out with his design engineering perspective, and he's developed that at Nuvasive and Apple. This is our second startup together. We've been developing Relay Play over the last year, and we've also become members during that time of the San Diego Tourism Authority. Again, my name is Ron Baldwin, and at Relay Play, we are raising a $250,000 round to grow awareness of our platform. To, and build that base of subscribers, as well as to continue to pursue more data science components that will allow our experts to make recommendations faster and faster. If you'd like to try out the platform, feel free to sign up, try us out at relayplay.com. And if you'd like to get in touch with me directly, here is my email address and direct phone number. Thank you so much, and we'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much. We have few questions. Is it too costly to hire real human experts? And will the subscription fee and other revenue cover this cost? Yep, those are great questions. So no, it's not too costly. If you take a look at a lot of these other platforms that are that are doing this shared type of platforms, whether it be Uber or Stitch Fix, or actually hiring someone to do a job, um, we were able to do that, but not have to pay them a significant amount to be able to do it. And when we incorporate a lot of the data science components that we have here as well, where we can start clustering users with very similar interests, we can take those and, and make it a much more scalable to, to launch out those recommendations to a larger number of users. And Lada, what was the second part of that question? Will the subscription fee cover that? Subscription fee comes pretty close to covering that, yes, based on the amount of time that it takes for our users, or for our experts to actually provide the recommendations, it comes pretty close to covering that. And again, as we scale, uh, the goal is driving that time down to be lower and lower. How do you find these uh, real human experts? And do you actually need them for the system to work? 
Sure, that's a great question. So, um, you know, <laughs> I could go in there and I could I could do it all myself if I wanted to, but that, that defeats the value. Um, we find these experts because they're they're all over cities. They're the people that you would generally go to, um, who, who are very good planners, who know all about what's happening within a city. And we haven't had any trouble actually sourcing these people. They're super excited as soon as they see our platform. They're like, "Oh my God, I already do this for all my friends. I would love to be able to do this with other people as well." So we don't have any problem actually actually sorting sourcing them. And we think that that's the big value of what we're actually creating here is, is using those experts to provide those recommendations. So I think if we took that away, it would completely negate what we're doing. Uh, hi, my name is Saket. I'm, and I'm Casey. And we're Remora, a ready start our team building Roombas for the ocean. So every year, nearly 1.4 billion pounds of trash ends up in our oceans. And that's one garbage truck filled with trash being dumped every single minute. Now, this trash devastates ecosystems, killing millions of fish and turtles, and finally ending up in the food that we eat, the sushi, the salmon, everything like that. And once this trash makes its way into the open ocean, it's a logistical nightmare to collect. And when nearly 80% of all marine trash is sourced near the shore, our ports, harbors, and bays are the first line of defense. According to a study from Deloitte, Waterfront organizations are already spending a total of $10.3 billion annually on trash cleanup. They're just not doing it very efficiently. And they lose $2.3 billion in revenue from tourism and aquaculture. Now, most of these waterways use humans on boats collecting the trash with nets, like you can see in this picture. And while that's admirable, it's incredibly labor intensive and expensive to scale to make the changing trash amounts from day to day and season to season. And that's why we're creating the Remora. The Remora is a system of trash eating aqua drones that actively track and collect debris for waterfront management departments and cleanup companies. The vehicles utilize machine learning algorithms to predict the locations of high density trash hotspots for efficient cleanup. They allow for hands off and on demand deployment for ease of operation and scalability. And they're tech forward, allowing for over the air updates and plug and play sensor functionality. Our, our drones will navigate via remote control or autonomously using computer vision with visual and IR cameras, ultrasonic proximity sensors, and GPS module. This combination allows us to safely collect trash while also avoiding obstacles, which requires min minimal human input and provides the ability for hands-off operation and makes them easy to scale. Now, fortunately for us, trash naturally tends to collect in hotspots, as you can see here at the Port of San Diego. However, these hotspots are constantly on the move based on factors like temperature, winds, and tides. And unfortunately, the data on this is hardly ever recorded, making it very difficult to use. With the introduction of our machine learning algorithms, we'll be gathering the data from our onboard sensors and correlating it back to its locations in order to predict where these hotspots are before the devices even get to the area. Now, this enables each drone to plan efficient routes and most importantly, collect more debris. Now, finally, once these devices either fill up with debris or they complete their routes, they navigate themselves back to the hub where they dock. And while they're docked, they drop off their trash for ease, centralized pickup. They're charged by onboard solar panels or the shoreline grid, and they transmit their data back to our machine learning systems to do their job. It's the inclusion of this hub that allows the system to be self-sustaining and run longer without human input. Now, our team's already developed a prototype to meet these customer needs. As you can see in the top left, and, and you can see our team mascot in the top right corner too. You can say hi to Deputy. Uh, with this prototype, we've already had uh, organizations that are interested in pilot projects like the Singapore Water Board, uh, the Port of San Diego, and the city of Temecula. Now, the most common solution, like we talked about previously, is just human operated boats like the Zephyr. But there's also cleanup devices like the Seabin, a stationary trash collection device, and the Wayshark, a similar aqua drone. The Remora outperforms these other cleanup devices by requiring less human inputs is fully electrically powered and benefits from our hotspot mapping for efficient collection. This allows it to scale easily and it can fit into tight areas and in more open water. And we've identified two key customers which the Remora system has been shaped around. The first is maintenance and cleanup departments at organizations like the Port of San Diego, the Singapore Water Board and Diversified Waterscapes, which is a contractor in this space and can benefit from our enhanced cleanup capabilities. And second, there are environmental researchers and compliance departments 
at places like Scripps Institution of Oceanography, NOAA, and also similar places within the Port of San Diego in different departments that struggle with collecting the data on their own. Now, our customers can benefit from the Remora initially through their capital purchases or hardware as a service. And as our autonomous capabilities develop, we plan to also offer contracted services where we then perform the cleanup operations ourselves and benefit from those improved efficiencies as well. Uh, so if our customers have shown willingness to pay of $100,000 to $150,000 annually for contracted services and $30,000 for capital purchases, each of our devices should cost about $5,000 in goods of cost of goods sold, and that's over a 15-year device lifespan. Now, like we talked about previously, this is a global problem, right? And funding is rapidly being provided to solve it. We plan to first focus on the $76 million U.S. market and then to the $9.7 billion Indo-Pacific market in Asia, where a lot of this spending is really taking place. And although this is a young industry, there's significant investment and commercial success with companies in this space. Some key partners that we have identified are companies like Four Oceans with 30 million in sales and the Ocean Cleanup with 35 million, who share a mission statement, but have not yet developed products in the specific area the Remora system excels in. Now, the obvious question, right? People always ask, what are you gonna do with the trash after you collect it? Well, we plan on selling this trash to upcycling companies. And there's a clear pathway there and donating those proceeds to environmental education effort. That allows us for a two-pronged approach to really addressing ocean plastics at its core. Now, we have an amazing team with years of professional design, robotics, fabrication, and machine learning experience, and strong mentors from Scripps Oceanography and UC San Diego. This will help us to break into that niche ocean cleanup space. And over the last couple of years, we've gone through multiple incubators and competitions, conducted rounds of customer interviews. And we, we've raised $100,000 over the, just the last year. Right now, we're currently seeking funding to build a commercially ready MVP from the prototype that we had previously, as well as building a full board of advisors. If you're interested in that there, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, thanks for listening. We are Remora, creating clean solutions for sea pollution. Thank you, Remora. And we have a question regarding, can you clean up microplastics? That's a really good question. So we see ourselves as, as kind of the first line of defense before the microplastics themselves even form. Because 80% of trash is first sourced kind of near the shore, it typically breaks down into those plastics after years of being out in the open oceans. And by addressing it closer to shore, we, we plan on basically preventing those microplastics from forming in the first place. Right now, our device does not have the capacity to clean up those microplastics, but that is something we, we look to kind of expand into in the future as well. Great, thank you. We have two more presentations and then we will have the Audience Choice Award. Good evening, everybody. My name is Rafael. I am a 2020 MBA radio alumnus and a product developer with experience in food and beverage industry. I'm here with Alonso Mujica, who is CEO of Syllabus.com, marketing specialist and industrial engineer. I got to know him because last year Syllabus was incubated on the Lato Market Pro Capstone Project at Ready School of Management. As a diversity and inclusion advocate, I know that the disparities in access to education and social differences in America directly affect Latino kids pursuing to improve their tech skills. Currently, only 2% of the STEM jobs are held by Latinas, and we will not see dramatic changes on this pattern if we don't give opportunities to kids that have been affected by the past incidents, for example, by the border and addressing the families of first and second generation Latino immigrants. Let's be really clear that although everybody in tech knows there is a gap in STEM job positions for diverse people, they will not be filled until we provide affordable educational training to underrepresented minorities, in this case, the Latino community. With that said, I'm happy to introduce you to syllabus.com, which is a startup that connects Latino kids to coding classes in Spanish with online courses to learn or reinforce your coding skills and receive the quality education required for today's digital world. This is a market that not only is growing up fast because of the pressure of having to study at home, obviously, but also because we know that the demand of social responsible activities will boost the market with investments from people and institutions willing to help Latino community. We cannot forget there is more than those kids in, at the border in similar, similar situation. There's actually 8 million kids that still don't speak English in America with a total clear canvas of what their future is going to be.
Welcome to Syllabus, where we combine our K-12 curriculum in Spanish, a social learning platform technology, uh, crowdfunding for raising grants and uh, revenue from investors and corporate partners, and also digital tracking to measure the accomplishments of the students. Now, this is the tool where you will find all the ecosystem that you need in order to develop the digital talent and the creativity of the K-12 students. Also, if you're a corporate sponsor, you're in charge of a, of a foundation, or you're an individual donor that wants to support and help uh, bridge the gap between education and uh, uh, digital uh, literacy in kids in Latin America or in Spanish speaking United States, you can sponsor them here and you will find all the projects that we're performing in different parts of the, of the world. Also, the interesting part is that kids today are learning in a very different way. They're consuming content, interacting with each other in, in through social media, gaming, and so on. So we have built a platform that grants this to the students, a social learning experience where they will be able to uh, interact between each other, form teams, challenges, uh, and, and other very funny uh, activities. And because we know that you're probably worried about the your kids' education, or you're a teacher and you also want to know how they're performing, you will be able to track this for a KPI. So you will be able to see the activities, how they're doing in the challenges and, and everything that you need uh, information so you can see uh, the kids' performance. We believe that this peer-to-peer uh, -peer bilingual approach and also providing a social ecosystem where the kids can develop their creativity and, and uh, through a community-based learning uh, is the best uh, in-class appro approach to solve this problem. And also we uh, are a very strong platform because we provide value for different actors of this education ecosystem as well. Our business model consists in selling a $45 annual license per student through government grants, schools, enterprises, and other CSR institutions. Companies can also invest on us by doing donations through Subodos Foundation, where we redirect these uh, investments directly to kids in Latin America and America. We are a very passionate and diverse team that combines experience in business, technology, and education. And we have two former ministers and a serial entrepreneur as advisors. Syllabus uh, began with a very face-to-face -face approach and then we tested and validated going into like a more blended and digital approach and 2020 was a, a year that basically changed everything for the education world. So we decided to approach 100% digital curriculum and digital classes and we uh, scaled into 15 countries. And where we are right now is we are enhancing the platform experience and we are focusing on growing our user base across Latino population in different countries in Latin America and also the United States. In order to uh, hit these milestones, where, where we are right now is we have had more than 20,000 students only in the last year, uh, students from 15 different countries and more than 150 schools. And we want to become, uh, by 2025, uh, 124 million revenue company by year. So then our next milestone is to get into a series A uh, between the, the following 12 to 18 months. And, to enter, and in order to do that, we are raising a bridge round of 300K. And we, we are going to focus uh, most of the funds in, in product development, in commercial development, and a go-to-market strategy in the USA to reach out to distribution partners, to apply into uh, government grants, and to focus very much on growing our user base in terms of marketing and, and building an inbound and a uh, growth uh, strategy machine. So if you're an investor, I want to help us bridge uh, this uh, very important gap where minorities uh, are in the need of entering the STEM world in STEM careers and through computer science, programming, engineering as well or do you, you also have tech savviness or product savviness and want to hop in and collaborate with this very strong mission, uh, contact us and reach us. And we invite you today to join us and to help us uh, empower and develop the talent of the Spanish speaking youth 
and uh, help them become tech leaders of the future. Almost all programming languages are based on English. How do you address this problem when, when they, they aren't fluent in English? Okay, so we, uh, we combine uh, both. So we, we teach them in Spanish, but the programming language, uh, we teach them in English. So we, when, when we teach them the pseudocode and we show them the blocks and the uh, commands that they will, be, uh, they will need to go in English, first we show them in Spanish and then we show them the equivalent in English. So they're kind of relating both languages and into the programming language. So they program in actually in English, but uh, first, we make an introduction in their natural language that is the Spanish. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sai, CEO of Stasis, and I'm a current MS student at UCSD. The impact of technology has been widespread on mankind. Evolution has taught us how to use tools and become more productive. Just a generation ago, having a personal computer or having access to virtually unlimited information at your fingertips was just a figment of our imagination. With the help of innovations like Microsoft's Windows platform and Apple's iPhone, this has become a reality. At Stasis, we are thinking about the next big step. We want to be a key player in this emerging field of telehealth. We want to build a product that enables users to have immediate access to unlimited information, uh, personal biometrics, where their daily performance is enhanced by AI. Similar to how Microsoft discovered the need for personal computers, we've discovered this universal need for better balance. We noticed that this need for better balance was prevalent in many fields. Body balance is one of the first les lessons taught in sports. Take baseball, for example. There are some players who can naturally develop great feet positioning, but there are many who can benefit from data-driven feedback to address their specific problems. At rehab centers, physical therapists use expensive equipment to evaluate a patient's balance. Some senior citizens, as well as those suffering from neuro diseases, are at a high risk of falling caused by poor proprioception. Currently, there is no solution that lets you obtain your balance metrics in real time as you walk or go about your daily activities. It just takes too long to get your results and they're never personalized to your needs. They can be quite expensive and quite inconvenient to use. At Stasis, we are here to address just these problems. We've developed a shoe insole that provides personalized real-time balance, feedback, and training. Our insole collects data and uses AI to evaluate your balance and determines the best vibrational feedback pattern. And in response, the user will adjust their feet and move their feet into a more stable position. For instance, if the feet of the user are too close together, the insides of the insole would vibrate in a specific pattern, cueing them to move their feet over apart. And this pattern will be learned over time by our AI uh, model. And similar movements can be cued by vibrating different parts of their feet and in different patterns. Our onboard computer in the insole analyzes the data provided by these various sensors and displays this information on an accompanying phone app. The feedback users receive is also personalized to their needs and our solution is cheaper, much more convenient to use and provides you with the results anywhere, anytime. The balance market itself can be broken down into four key target markets. Rehabilitation, sports, seniors, and neuro diseases. Although all of us have balance in our lives, these are the four key target markets that we chose to address. The first, the most important one that we're gonna talk about is sports. Let's take a, take a deeper look. Examples include baseball, cricket, golf, and all of these require very good balance in order to be a play successfully in, the, in those games. And at Stasis, we're addressing all of these. So how big is this market? For sports equipment alone, it's $126 billion. And the remaining consists of devices for physical rehab and neuro diseases. They contribute approximately $20 billion. I know what you're thinking. This is a huge market. And that's why we've chosen a small portion to begin with. And this is that of golf equipment. This is a $6.7 billion market and our first product will be called Stasis Golf. Then with application specific modifications, we will target the remainder of the balance market. This also gives us a chance to validate our technology. Now, why have we chosen golf? We've spoken to many um, golf professionals and uh, 
our advisor himself is a golf professional and we've received compelling feedback from them saying this is a product can directly apply for, to my game and I can get better with it and I want to use it. And they said balance is one of the key metrics for sports like golf. And it also allows for a much quicker product validation strategy for, especially for electronic product like ours. We need to validate it with actual usage. And this does not require any medical clearances, therefore speeding the process up. And third, there's many products in this space that have been well adopted validating this huge market. Let's take a, a look at a few examples. IOFIT, based in Korea, they were very well adopted into the golf community right after launch. They make smart shoe insoles and uh, shoe smart shoes for golf and other applications. Golf Tech, you may have heard of if you play golf, is it provides tech assisted golf lessons. And they raised uh, $5 million in revenue and uh, are uh, at over $60 million in sales. A smaller app, but more still effective is Swing AI. They raised $3 million in revenue. What sets us apart from this whole market is that we are the only product that is targeting all the features that golfers are looking for in one solution. In a, one that's affordable, provides on-the-go analysis, convenient to use, and provides personalized feedback to address their problems. Our business models uh, consist of, um, our key partners include golf institutions, equipment stores, and golf clubs. And we'd also like to partner with insole manufacturers and PCB manufacturers down the line. Our revenue stream is twofold. One is the actual hardware sale of our insole. And the second is a subscription-based model for advanced data analysis feature on the app. Our sales channels are through uh, physical stores like, Amazon, uh, our, like golf equipment stores and also online stores like our website or Amazon. So far, we've conducted uh, interviews with over 21 people just in the space of golf. We've built a preliminary prototype We've, when we competed at the design competition, we won the most popular product award, and we've competed over five incubator and accelerator programs at UCSD. We've got a, a pending patent on this tech. The screenshot here shows a brief uh, sneak peek into our uh, app, which is under development. Looking ahead, we'd like to complete our MVP, and we're, we need to raise funds to speed up our uh, um, MVP development process, as well as uh, attain uh, funds for pilot program. What are we asking? We are seeking angel investment so that we can get this done. And we're looking for engineering talent to help us out in this space. And we also would like to partner with uh, any insole or PCB manufacturers if you have contact with them. Our team is, our company is run by a team of dedicated individuals with cross disciplinary ex project and leadership experience from, we're all Stanford, uh, combined we have Stanford and UCSD graduates are currently pursuing education. Our advisors are backed by a group of um, our Michael Collins, Dr. Riker, and Rakesh. They're all experts in their own fields, business, uh, invention, and um, technology. And this is, our, this is our product. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Great, thank you. Um, we do have a couple questions actually from an orthopedic surgeon. So what do you mean by feet too close together? How are you measuring a pa patient's actual gait versus the normal gait using this product? Right, so we have multiple sensors that actually detect how uh, close the feet are. One of them is uh, the Bluetooth technology itself. Uh, we have Bluetooth sensors on both insoles that can detect the rough orientation of the, uh, the rough distance between the feet and whether it's a safe or unsafe position. For example, if their feet are they're, they're too close together, but they're like that, that's more stable than if they're like that. So we can detect the difference between the two. And not only that, we can detect the difference between this and this. And that way we can understand, we can give them a balance score as to where you're 50% of the way there or you're perfectly balanced. Okay, and then kind of a follow-up, how are you measuring the mechanical versus atomic axis of the lower extremities that are required to truly understand how people walk? So we, we are not targeting um, um, the, the every single detail of a person's um, a walking pattern. So what we are targeting is essentially uh, in our first product is enhancing a person's game for golf. But when we target the remaining um, parts, which is um, rehab. So I, I can see this question being applied there. So at that point, we will be doing a clinical study with a lot of patients undergoing rehab and understand if our current sensors in the insole are sufficient 
or we can get more sensors. So that is something we'd look into uh, further down the line. Great, thank you very much. So now that you've heard all of the presentations, we'd like you to participate and vote for your favorite Start Our Company presentation. So if you would just go to slido.com and enter Start R into the bar um, and vote for your favorite, that would be fantastic. So the, if you go to slido.com, it should look something like this uh, bar down here with the black banner and then hashtag start R. You just have to type start R. Don't add that ha hashtag. So we'll have about a minute to vote for your favorite. I know, tough choice, but we do appreciate you guys uh, participating. Um, all the winners for the audience choice will win $250. And we have a second award for excellence, also $250. So a couple of things. Um, go ahead and vote for one of the 11 teams, which were your favorite. And just a brief reminder, uh, we are now accepting applications to the new Stardar uh, cohort, Stardar Rady, Inclusion, Impact, Veteran, um, applications are open until February 21st. If you have any questions, please email us at seed at ready.ucsd.edu. And we're happy to answer any other questions you have regarding the applications or qualifications, et cetera. Um, I also would like to invite you guys to consider applying for the Global Social Innovation Challenge in April. Uh, this is a a competition, global competition in partnership with the Changemaker Institute and Center for Social Innovation and Impact. Um, we'll launch, we're, this is our third year launching the uh, competition and we invite student-led teams focused on sustainable change to apply in April. So that's very exciting. <laughs> and lastly, if you're interested in becoming a Stardar sponsor, please contact us. And with that, the audience choice poll is now about to close. I'm going to invite the judges back. Hello, we are back with the results. And if you wanna to go to the next slide. So we first like to announce the Start Our Audience Choice Award. And that goes to, drum roll, Curies. Yay! Congratulations, Curies. And then so for our second award for another $250, I'd like to announce, start our inclusion team, drum roll, Jeweled. Yay! I know in a virtual world, we are all clapping. We got a check, I'm so excited. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm taking a picture. I'm like going to cry. Thank you everyone for attending tonight. We appreciate the audience, our mentors, our sponsors, all for coming out virtually to attend Start Our Demo Day. Hopefully we will be back on campus soon presenting to you live. And we'd love for you to connect with our teams um, virtually. So here is all the contact information. Great. Thank you. Good night.